bringing in brain to the to the idea of, of prevention and uh, transferring messages like this what we have here this is your brain this is this is drugs and then this is your brain on drugs and trying to kind of uh, uh, make people avoiding using drugs because of these messages. The results with the, from the machine learning studies suggest that the impulsive antisocial aspects of psychopathy are common to both uh, heroin and, uh, and amphetamine dependence, which suggests that, uh, but their, uh, the other predictors were uh, different, which suggests that different mechanisms may underlie opiate and stimulant uh, addiction. Impulsivity is, um, is key, as is as is poor self-regulation. Poor self-regulation was highly intercorrelated with impulsivity. Poor self-regulation, it characterizes all high-risk behaviors, including substance abuse and all other, many other mental health disorders. Um, and they are, poor self-regulation is preventable. So why neuroscience? Why focus our prevention effort um, using neuroscience? So one, we know that logistically it's easy, right? Kids are already in science classes, and so we can easily incorporate this into existing curriculum in the schools. So teachers like it. Um, we also know that there's some really cool research showing that young people show increased interest in neuroscience content. So when you present information to them that's backed by neuroscience, they're more likely to show interest in it and to believe it and to find it credible. Cognitive resilience could uh, include a different cognitive function or brain-derived ability and process for coping with the negative uh, consequences of stressful condition or adversity and try to maintain their brain abilities to uh, pass from the crisis and also solve um, problems or uh, efficiently make decision in this regard. Hello everyone and welcome to this session. Um, my name is Tara Rezapur and I'm so happy to be here as the co-chair of this plenary session. During this session, you all are gonna hear five impressed talk in the field of uh, neuroscience-based prevention for drug addiction and uh, we hope that you all enjoyed this session. So, uh, because we may uh, face some time limitation for the last uh, part of this session, we try to keep our time and uh, rapidly introduce ourselves. So, let's get started with Dr. Uh, Jasmine Vasileva, another co-chair of this panel. And um, I will try to uh, quickly uh, read her bio. Uh, Dr. Vasileva is an associate professor of psychiatry and psychology at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. Her program of research focuses on personality and neurocognitive risk factors for addiction and on neurocognitive consequences of chronic drug use. Her studies over the past 10 years have focused on investigating the role of various dimensions of impulsivity and different subtypes of addiction using neurocognitive, polygenic, and computational approaches. Many of her studies involve international collaboration with colleagues in Europe and Asia, and she does direct the Neurocognitive Research Lab for the Study of Addiction at the Bulgarian Addiction Institute in Sofia, Bulgaria. Uh, Jasmine, we are so happy to have you here and would you please, please continue the session and introduce the others. Thank you so much, uh, Tara. It's a real pleasure to be here and to present at this uh, conference. Um, I I'm going to introduce the first speaker, uh, Dr. Hamed Ektiari. Uh, who is a research assistant professor uh, at the Laureate Institute for Brain Research in Tulsa, Oklahoma. His main research interests include uh, neuroimaging, using neuroimaging and neurocognitive markers among people with substance use disorders to inform development, predict outcome, and monitor efficacy of non-invasive transcranial electrical magnetic stimulation and neurocognitive interventions. He is also contributing to four international vo virtual collaborative networks for neuroscience as a co-chair and uh, director. Uh, so it's a real pleasure for me to um, uh, give the stage to Dr. Ektiari and to listen to his uh, talk on uh, uh, neuroscience-informed addiction prevention. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm really happy that I'm here. And thank you very much, Tara and Jasmine, for putting together this really nice panel. And I hope that we kind of that would be a starting point for further collaborations 
in this area. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to give you an overview about what we are we're going to discuss today with the different speakers. So we'll start to think about how we can have a neuroscience informed addiction prevention. So when we talk about neuroscience informed addiction prevention, uh, let's just start to think about how we can have things like biology informed diabetes mellitus prevention. So an area that people have been more successful and have developed different different sort of interventions. And when we talk about prevention of, of something like diabetes, we know that there are three major areas that we can think about in terms of prevention. First of all, finding those who are susceptible uh, with different markers, with different kind of biological markers. And we do that for diabetes in terms of who is going to be more susceptible to diabetes. And then think about how we can educate people in terms of avoiding some specific behaviors, trying to help them to realize that how they can prevent, uh, prevent diabetes, and also thinking how we can make people more resilient. So that is, that is the idea that we have with, let's say, biology-informed diabetes prevention. But how can we have these uh, types of interventions for, for addiction? So thinking about how we can have neuroscience inform addiction prevention in terms of finding people, educating people, and making people more resilient. So this would be the, the main structure of what we are going to discuss today together. And there are brilliant speakers today who would discuss about different, different aspects of these dimensions. But let me talk about the, the first issue in terms of finding those who are susceptible to addiction and think about how we can, we can define that. When we talk about the propensity of those who are going to have transition from drug use to drug addiction, and also think about the socioeconomic status of people, it seems that we can have a graph like this in terms of those who are more vulnerable or more susceptible to drug use, especially in, in certain socioeconomic status, they could have higher risk for, for getting drug dependent. And of course, even those who are not vulnerable and they are in a really good socioeconomic status, they can still be susceptible. So we can still have those who are gonna uh, be dependent to drugs, but we are talking about risk and how we might be able to, to define this, this propensity and this vulnerability to drug addiction. So thinking about how we can define those who are susceptible and those who are not susceptible to, to addiction. And thinking about addiction as a, a process of moving from non-drug user to being a non-problematic or recreational user to those who are escalating in drug, their drug use, and then moving from that to the, the compulsive drug use and from compulsive drug use probably to being a treatment seeker or not. So that is the, the process that we have for addiction. And for all these uh, stages, we have different experimental paradigms that are helpful for us to, to be able to test those who are gonna be susceptible to get into the problematic drug use and move from drug use to escalating drug use and, and getting dependent to drugs. So that is the, the process that we do in neuroscience to be able to understand who is going to be more susceptible. And in reality, many of those studies are, are happening among, among uh, animal, inside animal models. And just give you a, one sample animal models that uh, give us an idea about how neuroscience could inform uh, addiction prevention. This is a really nice job by uh, Michael Nader uh, team from uh, Wake Forest. What they have done, they uh, try to put together a group of monkeys that they have been raised independently or uh, kind of, uh, standalone or, or in, in different environments. So they, they put them together in a socially housed environment and they have been exploring how this social interaction between these monkeys would contribute to, to, be, uh, to, to substance use. So when they put them together, they realize that they can make what they call a social ranking process. So they, they get into different ranks in their, their small social community and how we define who has higher rank among monkeys, how, how experimentally how we can, we can find which monkey is in a higher rank. So the process is, is happening with what we call grooming. 
and it, people realize that grooming is something that would define who is on the higher rank. So the, the monkey who is on, in the lower rank would groom the monkey who is on the higher rank. So that is that is the the way that we uh, we realize that it is close to what we do as as human being in terms of how we interact with the kind of the, the chair of our center or I don't know I don't know that, that is that is something that we do in terms of the interaction and uh, this is the way that they define who is on the on a higher rank so in that environment they would have kind of different ranks and they realize that when uh, we, they have a, a monkey with a higher rank there would be a significant increase in the level of uh, dopamine receptor availability in their brain. And it is not the case, so as you can see here, so those who are going to be socially housed, if they get dominant in the community, they would have higher dopamine receptor availability inside their brain. And those who are subordinate, they still have it in the social environment, they still have higher level of dopamine availability, but that would not be as significant as the, the dominant monkey would experience. And they realize that if they put these monkeys in an environment that they can have access to drugs, what they can have is they realize that the, the subordinate monkey would start to use more from cocaine and they would be more vulnerable to start to use, to get dependent to, to, to cocaine and that would make things complex for, for the subordinate monkey. And compared to that, the the dominant monkey would not use uh, uh, cocaine at the same level. And you can imagine how that could be translated to the idea of uh, those who are more susceptible to drug use. But in reality, when we talk about this, the, the dimension that I showed you, as you can see here, it is going to be a little bit complex in terms of defining the susceptibility as an independent factor to socioeconomic status or the environment that we, we talk about. So those who are susceptible and the, the susceptibility factor in, inside the brain would definitely would be affected by the, the environmental factor. So they would be interacting with each other. So they are not going to be something like perpendicular items that are not related. So they are interacting with each other and that would make things even more complex. So using these animal models, we have learned a lot in terms of what are the areas that are involved in, in getting involved in drug use and how drug use could get to the compulsive drug use. But in reality, over the time, people realize that these uh, animal models, whether they are uh, rat models or, or monkey models, we can have different interventions in these groups that are effective in terms of reducing drug use or changing drug use behavior. But in reality, when we bring them to the human model, there is no effect for these, these interventions. And that makes things really complex in terms of how we can use these animal models and the understanding that we have from these animal models to the human models. And that would make things a little bit complex. So what we do, we try to use human models in, in laboratories, trying to provide them with a specific, let's say, decision-making paradigms, trying to test how much they are uh, risk takers and how much they are kind of gonna be uh, discounting delayed rewards and how they, they process these things with functional imaging, cognitive models, self-reports, tasks, and other things. But in reality, we realize that there is always a, a discrepancy with what we have in the lab models and what we have in the real life. And that is the complexity of, of this field, trying to find the things that we have in the laboratory and have that in the, kind of, in the real life. And that is, that is the, the complex part of this process. There is a recent publication, they tried to use the various different uh, self-reports and behavioral tasks that we have, trying to see if these self-reports would be able to predict uh, drug use behavior in, in, a, in the real environment. They have recruited 500 subjects. Uh, there are limitations for this study, but it is quite interesting in terms of seeing that th they try to predict different sorts of behaviors with using these, let's say, self-reports. And I'm just going to show you the, the results that they have for drug use. With, with self-reports, they have been so kind of successful in predicting something like 7% of the variance 
of drug use behavior in, uh, in sample prediction. But when they do cross-validated uh, assessments, that would be something like 2% which is not really promising. So we know that that is, that is not re a really good percent. It is still significant, but I mean, there is a kind of uh, difference between being significant and being clinically and uh, kind of pragmatically uh, significant. And then for the behavioral task, they realize that almost there is almost no effect of using these behavioral tasks to, to be able to predict risky behavior. So there are challenges and there are limitations for this study as well, but this is something that we are facing. And then thinking about how we can have probably larger studies and court studies, because the previous one was a cross-sectional study, how we can predict the behaviors based on the assessments that we do in baseline. And then we have uh, what we call adolescent brain and cognitive development project ABCD. And we already have uh, key figures from, from this project, Lindsay, who is already involved in this project, uh, trying to see how we can follow a uh, huge database of, of uh, kids in the process of their development. But even in the first steps in terms of trying to use whatever we have in uh, baseline assessments and the follow-up assessment, trying, for example, use the brain imaging that we have to predict things like IQ, uh, there are different challenges and people try to see how they can do that. And in the best case scenario, they can predict something like 5% up to something like 7, 8% of the variance using the, the brain imaging tools that we have. So we know that there would be challenges in terms of, it is always easy to find a significant result, but how the significant result is going to explain a large and a reasonable uh, percent of the variance that is going to be a complex part. So there are challenges for that side. And then think about other things in terms of educating or making people resilient for, 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 dro for, uh, for drug use. In terms of educating people for, for drug use prevention, we already have, I mean, I'm sure Diana and others will talk about different, different projects that people are doing around the world. But we know that there are uh, kind of different, different interventions. For example, the DARE intervention that has been in place for, for a long period of time. And we all know that there are uh, frustrations in, in terms of some of the kind of long-term outcomes of, of these uh, education-based interventions. And, and there, are, there are challenges with these, these interventions. And even bringing in brain to the, to the idea of, of prevention and uh, transferring messages like this, what we have here, this is your brain, this is, this is drugs, and then this is your brain on drugs, and trying to kind of make people avoiding using drugs because of these messages. And they realize that there are, there are challenges of how, how, how these sort of neuroscience-informed messages are going to uh, make a, a real impact on, on people. So what we do, we are mainly from the um, I'm mainly from the uh, addiction treatment and recovery side, and trying to see how those things are are gonna kind of uh, be impactful uh, for for recovery. But how we can use kind of our more detailed understanding about brain and the process of brain recovery in in the process of both treatment and also prevention. So when we talk about kind of brain injuries regarding drug use is not just about brain injuries. We also talk about how you can use strategies to improve these, uh, these uh, brain functions and thinking about how we can do the same ideas for prevention, not only just giving them kind of uh, frightening messages, but also talking about uh, kind of more detailed uh, information and how they can move forward for, for, for prevention. And also thinking about the intervention, how we can define intervention in a way that would connect to people. Thinking about how we can define characters that would connect people uh, to, the, to the message that we have, trying to develop different sorts of cartoons that people can connect to from different ethnical or, or, or gender background and trying to use these cartoons for, for the idea of, of prevention. And also right now with the kind of situation that we have, thinking about how we can use online platforms for, for uh, delivering these interventions. Right now, we are working with Jasmine and Tara together, trying to kind of put together a, a new package, an online new package 
for for running these sort of kind of neuroscience informed psychoeducation packages. I'm just trying to kind of wrap up in just one minute, uh, thinking about kind of in the, the next level, think about how we can also do some more extensive trainings for people, making people more resilient. I'm sure Tara will talk, will talk about those those issues. The idea of how we can use uh, not targeting just kind of drug addiction, but kind of a more broadly talking about uh, self reports, uh, so, sorry, self control, and think about self control as a, a, a media for uh, making people more resilient. And, and talking about, let's say, food and other issues, and then moving from food and emotion and the other things towards substance use and, and bringing models regarding substance use. So that is that is what, what we are trying to do in, ter in terms of developing interventions on that that platform. And yes, that's that's the kind of the the, the last part of my, my presentation, talking about there are still major challenges in terms of how we can we can move forward. And we put together a special issue in Frontiers on how we can have brain and cognition for addiction medicine, uh, prevention to recovery. And we have kind of uh, contributions from, from different people who are already online right now with us in this specific special issue. Uh, as we have discussed in the editorial, from these 32 papers that we had, just three of them were talking about some sort of preventive measures. 29 of them were about uh, just treatment. And we know that prevention and, and neuroscience informed prevention is something that people are not uh, that much kind of uh, attending to. And that is, that is what we hope that this panel would bring in, in terms of the ideas of how we can uh, do and collaborate some uh, kind of research project on neuroscience informed prevention for drug addiction. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for your great talk. And uh, so we put the question, if uh, we have any question in the chat box for the uh, end of this session. And uh, let's start the second uh, talk by uh, Jasmine. Uh, she's going to talk about the impulsivity as a primary risk factor for drug addiction. And she's going to talk about the multidimensional, uh, 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 of multidimensional nature of these concept in different types of addiction. Just me. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, some neurocognitive risk factors for addiction, focusing specifically on impulsivity. On impulsivity, which is uh, one of the cardinal um, antecedent risk factors for virtually all kinds of addictive behaviors. Uh, but it also has bi-directional relationship with addiction in that it's uh, similarly a consequence of uh, chronic drug use that can result in uh, structural and functional impairments in the brain. Now, however, impulsivity, it's um, one difficulty in studying impulsivity is that it's uh, one of the most uh, multidimensional constructs in the literature that is comprised of multiple um, dimensions. Some of them are more stable trait dimensions of impulsivity, like personality dimensions, which as we know, impulsivity figures prominently in most major uh, theories of personality. Uh, it also has distinct neurocognitive manifestations uh, that are measured with uh, certain, uh, more that are more state dependent and more fluctuating depending on the current state of the individual or the environmental circumstances. Uh, they are measured in the laboratory with different um, neurocognitive measures of response inhibition, decision making, uh, delay discounting, and so on. Uh, these uh, state dimensions uh, typically uh, cluster in two main types. One is um, as choice impulsivity or impuls uh, sensitivity of uh, choices to delay measured with delay discounting tasks as well as sensitivity of choices to uh, risk measured with various gambling type of tasks with different reward and punishment contingencies. These dimensions relate differentially to uh, various psychiatric disorders, particularly uh, focusing, uh, clustering in the externalizing spectrum uh, of disorders. And research shows that they, these dimensions of impulsivity may be differentially related to different types of addiction. 
So the, the point is that there are various dimensions of impulsivity and there's also different types of addiction. Um, however, the, whereas the multidimensionality of impulsivity is uh, already well acknowledged by multiple uh, studies, uh, the um, addiction continues to be regarded as more unitary uh, in that most symptoms of addiction of substance use disorders with the exception of uh, tolerance and withdrawal are the same for all kinds of, for all uh, substance use disorders. Similarly, most theories of addiction uh, are unitary. They don't um, specify whether uh, they apply to uh, different types of drugs. However, research, both preclinical and clinical research indicates that uh, there are important differences between uh, different types of drugs. Uh, for example, preclinical studies show that um, high impulsivity predicts escalation of cocaine use, uh, but not of heroin um, uh, use. And similarly, um, unlimited access to cocaine, but not of heroin, leads to loss of control and uh, death by overdose. Now, the preclinical studies are much more clear than the um, human studies. And one major difference between the preclinical studies and the human studies is that the majority of the preclinical studies are based on single drug administration uh, paradigms, whereas the majority of human studies are based on polysubstance users, uh, as the polysubstance um, is the normal pattern of drug use in humans. So this presents a really significant uh, methodological difficulty of how do we study and how do we separate the effects of different types of drugs on neurocognitive uh, functioning. So to avoid uh, this uh, difficulty, uh, I want to talk about a program of research that we have developed in Bulgaria uh, where we have access to pure or monosubstance dependent um, heroin and amphetamine users, which allows us to um, dissociate the effects of heroin and amphetamine on neurocognitive functioning and examine both similarities and differences between these two types uh, of addiction. Uh, so in Bulgaria, uh, the reason why we do it in Bulgaria is that um, um, Bulgaria is situated on the Balkan drug trafficking route where the majority of heroin that goes from Afghanistan to Western Europe uh, goes through. So it's one of the major uh, trafficking center for heroin and heroin is a, a, a prime public health problem in the country. And Bulgaria is also one of the top countries in Europe for production of synthetic type amphetamines. So there is a separate cohort of substance users that are dependent on uh, amphetamine that don't typically use heroin. Uh, so we have tested uh, there over 700 uh, participants with uh, uh, extensive phenotypic assessment battery measuring uh, various dimensions of impulsivity, including uh, neurocognitive um, impulsivity, uh, uh, various tasks of neurocognitive impulsivity, a number of measures of uh, personality, um, as well as related constructs like sensation seeking, uh, aggression, psychopathy, as well as various externalizing uh, psychiatric measures of impulsivity. Uh, I would like to spend a little, um, to focus particularly on uh, computational approaches that we've taken with this uh, sample that have proven particularly informative. And the first um, study that we did uh, using machine learning, um, our goal was to determine which of these multiple dimensions of impulsivity would most accurately predict opiate and stimulant dependence in these Bulgarian users. And then which of these dimensions are common across opiates and stimulants and which are specific to the two different uh, types of drugs. So we did, uh, we uh, used the elastic net machine uh, learning algorithm and I had 54 predictors uh, that were entered into the model. Uh, and a number of them, there were a number of neurocognitive personality, psychiatric predictors, as well as uh, five demographic predictors. Of all of these 54 predictors, we found that only one was common to amphetamine and uh, heroin use. And that was psychopathy, which is an extreme variant of antisocial personality disorder. And the, 
uh, it was specifically the antisocial impulsive uh, factor of psychopathy uh, that was um, most predictive of uh, heroin and amphetamine uh, dependence. That was the only common factor. The callous and emotional factor of psychopathy was significant predictor of heroin, but not of amphetamine dependence. And uh, contrary to, uh, sorry, I keep going, but contrary to predictions, um, heroin dependence wa was not associated specifically with impulsivity. For example, we found that um, with exception of decision making, which was the only neurocognitive uh, predictor of uh, heroin dependence. Uh, however, uh, heroin dependence was predicted by reduced risk taking, uh, reduced uh, trade impulsivity, uh, by reduced motor and attentional impulsivity, reduced uh, hostility and aggression. Uh, but with higher uh, anxiety and depression. In contrast, amphetamine dependence was predicted primarily by sensation seeking and from the neurocognitive predictors, delay discounting was a unique predictor of amphetamine dependence as well as increased reaction time on um, a stop signal type of tasks, which is similar to the literature that we found uh, so far um, with stimulant drug use. So as we know, uh, the, we, we achieved a, re, a high classification accuracy, especially considering that all of our predictors were behavioral. There were no neuroimaging or no genetic predictors, which typically increase the accuracy, such that the area under the curve for heroin uh, dependence was 0.87, whereas for the amphetamine dependence was 0.74. Uh, we know that one of the major criticisms of machine learning uh, studies are the uh, replicability uh, problem. And we recently replicated uh, the study with a much larger sample size, we, with a three times larger sample size compared to our initial one. Similar to our first findings, we, find that we found that psychopathy, the antisocial impulsive factor of psychopathy was the most common predictor of both um, um, heroin and amphetamine dependence. And in addition, the experience seeking facet of sensation seeking emerged as another uh, common predictor of both. However, these remain the only two common predictors of uh, opiate and stimulant use. Again, psychopathy, the callous and emotional uh, factors were significant predictors of heroin dependence, uh, increased uh, impulsivity under negative emotional states, negative urgency, that was also significantly predicting uh, of amphetamine, as of heroin, as well as reduced attentional impulsivity and uh, motor impulsivity. Amphetamine, in contrast, was again um, predicted by high sensation seeking, high anxiety sensitivity, high uh, imp motor impulsivity on uh, neurocognitive tasks, lack of deliberation, um, uh, lack of premeditation, and again, increased uh, deliberation time. Uh, there were some predictors that were in opposite direction uh, in both, such as age. Uh, increased age was predictor of heroin dependence, whereas a younger age was predicting of amphetamine dependence. Length of abstinence was also significant, as well as various uh, motor impulsivity um, was in opposite direction in both, as well as sensation seeking and anxiety. Again, the prediction accuracy was high. It was even higher than our original uh, study, uh, area under the curve of 0.9 for the heroin and 0.86 for the amphetamine uh, users. So um, these results with the, from the machine learning studies suggest that the impulsive antisocial aspects of psychopathy are common to both uh, heroin and, uh, and amphetamine dependence, which suggests that, uh, but uh, the other predictors were uh, different, which suggests that different mechanisms may underlie opiate and stimulant uh, addictions. And that quick, economical, and easy to administer uh, neurobehavioral measures can identify objective behavioral markers of distinct addiction risk profiles. Um, then I want to uh, focus on an additional computational approach that we have taken recently, that is of using uh, computational modeling, uh, creating mathematical models of different neurocognitive functions, such as decision-making, um, that 
uh, really have proven to be really informative in uh, dissociating some of the underlying differences between different types of drugs. Uh, one benefit of these models is that their parameters are uh, much more stable than the uh, neurocognitive parameters of the standard uh, neurobehavioral performance parameters. And for example, if we take the first study that we did was with the Iowa gambling task, which is one of the most common uh, decision-making tasks in the literature. And as most neurocognitive tasks, they're created to be complex in order to reflect the, uh, to be ecologically valid and to um, reflect the complexity of real life. However, that makes it difficult to understand what are the underlying processes in these different uh, tasks. So computational modeling is really helpful in fractionating uh, these tasks into underlying latent processes. For example, on the decision-making on the Iowa gambling task, uh, impaired performance could be due to uh, reduced impaired learning or memory or to uh, re increase sensitivity to reward. Or on the other hand, it could also be due to decreased sensitivity to loss and punishment or to basically an inconsistent um, a response style. So when, what we found was that when we look at the normal behavioral performance on the task, there were no group differences between heroin and amphetamine users, even though both were more impaired uh, than control, uh, than control uh, participants on the task. However, the computational modeling results revealed that the impaired performance of um, uh, heroin and amphetamine users was due to different underlying mechanisms. Specifically, in amphetamine users, it was driven by increased sensitivity to reward, whereas in heroin users, it was driven by decreased sensitivity to loss. This suggests that different intervention strategies should be applied to these two types of, um, um, of uh, substance users that could more accurately target the underlying uh, mechanisms. We also replicated this finding with a different task, the balloon analog risk task, uh, with a different uh, computational model, where loss aversion again emerged, at, reduced loss aversion emerged as one of the most consistent um, findings specific to heroin. So in conclusion, the computational uh, model parameters could be very valuable uh, phenotyping tool for the study of addictions that I want to advocate for, and that their computational model parameters appear to be more sensitive to dissociating substance-specific neurocognitive impairments than standard neurobehavioral performance indices, and they could help refine neurocognitive phenotyping and develop more, help us develop more uh, rigorous mechanistic models of different subtypes of addiction. Uh, so I want to thank uh, my team in Bulgaria and the United States uh, for these um, uh, findings, uh, for these uh, studies. And I'm ready to take questions at, uh, at the end of the session. Thank you so much, Jasmine. It was really interesting data. As you told, we can use in the designing different intervention for different types of addiction. And, uh, thank you so much. So we can go for the next one if you uh, introduce the next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Um, Link, Dr. Diana Fishbein, uh, who is the director of the Translational uh, Neuroprevention Research in the Frank Porter Graham uh, Child Development Institute at the University of North Carolina. She is also part-time uh, research faculty in the Department of Human Development and Family Studies at the Pennsylvania State University. Dr. Fishbein's studies use transdisciplinary methods and a developmental approach to understanding interactions between neurobiological processes and environmental factors. Her research supports the premise that underlying neurobiological mechanisms interact with the quality of our psychosocial experiences in environmental contexts to alter trajectories either towards or away from risk behaviors. Her work further suggests that compensatory mechanisms can be strengthened with the appropriate psychosocial and environmental manipulations. She has published extensively and serves in an advisory capacity for federal and state government bodies, as well as several universities and organizations. Given the inherent translational nature of this research, she founded and directs the National Prevention Science Coalition for Improving Lives, which is a national organization dedicated to the transfer of knowledge 
from the basic sciences to practices in real world settings and public health policies. Um, Dr. Fishbein, you're very welcome to uh, present your talk. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Uh, these have been great talks and I think we are all very much um, synergized here in this panel. So I really appreciate Tara, you putting this together. Um, thanks everybody for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today about the applications of developmental neuroscience in prevention. I am going to focus on self-regulatory mechanisms um, in adolescent risk and resilience. Neuroprevention is a relatively new field, applications and findings and technologies that have developed in the field of neuroscience that can be applied to some burning questions that we have in the, uh, in the field of prevention that we have not been able to fully address. And so what we want to do is, is take advantage of the, what's going on in neuroscience to address these questions, most prevalent of which is the fact that even our best interventions, our model evidence-based interventions, only yield small to modest effect sizes. Um, and that has plagued the field for decades. Um, we haven't really been able to boost that. And so the issue is um, why? Where is the heterogeneity coming from? Why is it that most people um, don't respond well? So you can get clinical, uh, sorry, you can get statistical significance um, in terms of your effect sizes and publish that and everybody's happy, but it doesn't have the clinical utility that it could. Um, and so many people are not uh, benefiting from interventions that we're using. They're good, they need to be scaled, implemented broadly, and so forth, um, but you know the the field of prevention science and in collaboration with neuroscience needs to further address these issues so that we can refine our interventions to work better for more people, right? Um, so at this point in time, we don't know why some people respond favorably to intervention. We don't even know that much um, what interventions cause some people to respond favorably, where others do not. Uh, do well at all. And so as you can see in this little figure that with intervention, we have a subset of favorable responders um, that do quite well to any given intervention and a large group of non-responders or poorer responders um, that if we were to subtype them rather than aggregate our data, we might find that there are characteristics that distinguish them. And in fact, we might find that let's say type four um, does quite well but when aggregated, it diffuses the findings and we lose what's going on with these different subtypes who are differentially responding to intervention. So what is it about these subtypes? How do they respond differentially? And how can that contribute to more integrative inter uh, intervention models? Um, so we want to apply an etiological understanding of the risk behaviors that we're trying to prevent in the first place, right? Um, because those risks, those underpinnings of risk behaviors may actually be preventing some people from responding well to intervention. Okay, so the underlying generators of risk behavior may tell us something about how to respond better to intervention. And so we want to use this ideological information that can provide us with a blueprint uh, for the development of preventive intervention components that more directly target precursor conditions and exacerbating conditions to work better. And so what we would expect is that in individuals that do well, that these under, underpinnings of risk behavior are malleable and that those malleable mechanisms will move, will change coincident with behavioral change um, in those that respond well. And those that respond poorly, we do not expect these mechanisms to change. We are not moving that needle. And so we want to be able to map intervention components to these conditions so that we can improve the precision of our interventions and therefore our effect sizes. I mean, you know, if we're gonna be the statisticians, but certainly what that translates to is its clinical utility. And so we can benefit a greater number of recipients. So in my program of research for longer than I care to admit, uh, 
that um, is that uh, but they, my question has always been what works best for whom, why, and under what circumstances? So the what is the intervention, the whom are the moderators? What is moderating? What are the characteristics of the individual or their exposures and their experiences that they bring with them at baseline that might predict differential responses? And then why? Why are the mechanisms, the mediators? Why does this move? Why is this changing? Why is this not changing? And then under what circumstances? So uh, the circumstances might be the experiences and the contextual environment of the individual that predicts what, how they will respond, but it might also have to do with the setting in which the intervention is implemented. It might also have to do with, um, with the fidelity and the quality of the intervention. So implementation concerns are very key here as well. Um, so what does this tell us for, what does developmental neuroscience tell us for the field of prevention science? So just from the scientific perspective, four things generally. We, this, this huge body of information being generated by neuroscience is very relevant to prevention, what we understand about what undergirds behavior and emotional health. And so we have an explosion of information from this new generation of neuroscience about the brain. And we know so much more now about the social and biological determinants and how they interact, they don't function in isolation, to affect behavioral and emotional health. Number two, uh, this body of information emphasizes the vital importance of nurturing caregivers and nurturing environments on the way the brain grows and how healthy the brain is ultimately. So nurturing environments are actually key from a developmental neuroscience perspective. Number three, this body of research establishes that there are very negative effects from adverse childhood experiences. This, is, this body of knowledge is consensual. It's known, it, there's much more to be known. We have to differentiate different kinds of exposures, blah, blah, blah. But we know that, that ACEs is bad for your health, it's bad for your brain, uh, it's bad for your well being. And we have identified, and I say we globally, it's not like I'm doing all this, but we have identified uh, specific negative impacts of ACEs on the way the brain develops its structure and its function. Number four, and this is the brighter side of the equation, if you will, healthy attachment and socialization have been shown to actually strengthen these neuro, neural connections that, uh, that undergird adaptive learning and self-regulation. So there's a way out. So we can do things from a primary preventative perspective by understanding how all of this works to increase health, the health of the brain. Um, but we can also, when we don't, when we miss it, when the exposure is there and the individual is at risk and not doing well, interventions have potential to, to change the equation uh, by impacting the brain. Um, and so what does that mean for practice? This means that that there is a potential to integrate basic science, not just neuroscience, but basic social and behavioral science and epidemiology and so forth, um, to develop a more holistic model of the way we develop interventions, how we implement them, and importantly, policy that has the potential to have population level effects. So there are enormous implications for the prevention of problem and the promotion of problems and uh, promoting wellness. Um, this information can help guide the design, as I said, of targeted programs that are more precisely target these malleable aspects of brain by social contextual aspects of self-regulation. And this is key in terms of what we still don't know is that we're, you know, in the last few years, a number of us are starting to demonstrate that if a that if interventions are well-timed developmentally and they're evidence-based, there is potential to enhance neural maturation. And what I mean by that is that it can perhaps normalize maturation in children and adolescents that are at risk, that are disadvantaged, that are marginalized and so forth. Um, but it may also accelerate, not just normalize, but accelerate in children that have been falling behind. So, um, this has implications for potentially having a, a, a long-term impact at criti critical points in the developmental trajectory.
So we know that drug addiction is a developmental disease. Everybody has established that. Um, this is like an age old slide, but people including the director of NIDA continue to use it because it is so illustrative. So obviously addiction begins in adolescence. So prevention is critical because as Ahmed and Jasmine pointed out, this is a process, addiction is a process. People don't just all of a sudden become addicted to drugs. So the age at which drug dependence is first diagnosed for a number of you know, alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, and so on, it's typically in adolescence or early adulthood. There are multiple time points, uh, opportunities for intervention earlier on. Um, and research is aimed at preventing drug use from ever starting, from ever starting, by looking at these neurobiological mechanisms that are impacted by risk factors in the prevailing environment so that we can devise effective messages and intervention. With Jasmine, that, um, you know, impulsivity is, um, is key, as is as is poor self-regulation. Poor self-regulation was highly intercorrelated with impulsivity. Poor self-regulation, it characterizes all high-risk behaviors, including substance abuse and all of many other mental health disorders. Um, and they are, poor self-regulation is preventable. So these brain regulatory systems that are responsible for self-regulation and its manifestation uh, all begin to develop before age 11. And the regulation of these, um, of these systems involves behavior, emotion, the ability to adhere to social rules, not be impulsive about it, sleep cycles, stress responses, eating patterns, all of these self-regulatory mechanisms develop before the age of 11 and require that we address them uh, before age 11 if we're really gonna do primary prevention. Um, and what this means is that all these skills, behaviors, functions in adolescence are undergirded by self-regulatory mechanisms that develop in childhood, okay? So again, it's a process, it starts early. Um, so what's happening in adolescence, we focus on adolescence, you know, like I said, because that's when the behavior that we're trying to prevent begins to manifest. Um, adolescence brain function is changing. The brain is remodeling substantially. And the patterns of activation within the prefrontal cortex generally become more efficient and focused. And so that's the, the orange part in the figure that you see. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but in the figure that you see. That, um, that in this area, things within the prefrontal cortex throughout adolescence become more focused. Uh, but what's also important during this period of time, a uh, very plastic period of time, by the way, it's not over when you're in adolescence. People always ask me, isn't it too late? No, it is a tremendously malleable plastic period of, of life. So the activity in the prefrontal cortex becomes more coordinated with, with activity and networks in other parts of the brain, especially the limbic system. So this is the top-down control that we're interested in strengthening, the prefrontal cortex having a regulatory function over the affective emotional responses and the impulses and so forth of the limbic system. So the developmental milestones that I just showed you um, the ability to meet them reflect the extent to which these executive cognitive functions that are modulated by the front of the brain are maturing. So in essence, the, the development and the communication of the prefrontal cortex regulates these regions responsible for processing uh, emotion and reacting to stress. So the executive cognitive functions that Jasmine talked a lot about, it really forms the basis for behavioral and emotional self-regulation. And these changes, I will just say, do not occur in a vacuum. So I'll, I'll explain that in a second. So we eventually hit maturity. I'm always telling my kids, you know, you're not 30 yet. <laughs> Your brain isn't fully attached. Um, so, the, <laughs> um, and they're getting there and they're good. But um, the maturity of these functional connections begin to taper off at around age 22. But the process, while it slows, the process of maturation continues until just before the age of 30, as we think. Okay, so um, this is just a depiction, you know, on the left of sort of how it starts to taper off. And then we're mature by the time we're 30, hopefully. Um, and then the, the picture on the right shows that there are key aspects of, um, of 
of functioning that are, or key aspects, sorry, of development that are really important. So, you know, the green in particular is the cognitive control. It's the social cognition that we just talked about, executive cognitive function and so forth with its lower connections. And then you see in the orange, which is the, you know, the emotion and reward network. And so maturity happens when these things become a true network and are really communicating with one another. So this is normative. So this has nothing to do with addiction, right? This is just normative that it, adolescence is very protracted. It doesn't magically end at the age of 18. And so it goes on and there are critical, again, opportunities to intervene throughout. But if this is normative, it explains why many of our adolescents are sensation seeking and risk taking, but they may not go over the top. Okay. Um, so this is the dual process model of adolescent development. Everybody's probably seen it. It's old, but, um, but it's a good way to demonstrate that this is what's happening through adolescence. Um, and this is a little non-normative, if you will. And that, so we have in adolescence inhibitory control. So this is development of the prefrontal cortex. So your inhibitory control goes way up during normative adolescence. But what we also see is that reward sensitivity is disproportionately heightened. Um, and so kids go off, go a little bit off the rails, right? Even the good ones. Um, but when that's really exaggerated, when this effect is really exaggerated and the prefrontal cortex development is lagging behind, um, it may not be able to adequately control what's going on in the limbic system. And so you have greater reward sensitivity. Um, and so this gap is even greater in non-normative kids. And so you get these behavioral phenotypes of risk-taking, novelty-seeking, impulsivity, and that increases risk for harm from accidents, STDs, so forth, and the use of drugs. So, and I'm gonna try to truncate a little bit here, but just when you have that disconnect, you see differences in the, the development in kids, you see certain kinds of deficits that are manifested as language delays and problems with academic achievement and so forth. But then once you start to get into early adolescence, you see more aggression, sensation seeking and so forth. So it really is this poor prefrontal control over limbic regions that heighten sensitivity. Um, things that can really cause this disconnect right, this um, greater sensitivity to reward relative to cognitive control is stress. And we all know what stress does to us, but in a, from a developmental standpoint, stress can really wreak havoc on the brain's development. And in the context of, of drug abuse, stress and trauma, the field of drug abuse has been shown to predict early onset of drug use and its escalation. Uh, it also predicts relapse and it predicts treatment resistance. And interestingly, stress affects the brain in ways that um, affect specific areas, regions of the brain that are already shown to be perturbed in mental illnesses. So there's a lot of convergence here. And we see that this damage causes further delay to the brain and cognitive controls. It increases the actual sensitivity of these adolescents to, this, to drugs, to the uh, rewarding aspects of drugs. Um, and it exacerbates any existing mental health problems. So this is just an example from Marty Teacher's work of uh, uh, aggregate, in the aggregate of children who have not been maltreated versus those that have been maltreated. And just to show you that the connectivity, the connections between nodes of the brain are, are uh, scarce in those that have been maltreated. So the brain is not communicating the way it should, not able to self-regulate the way it should. And you're become less able to meet your developmental milestones and you show you know, emotional and behavioral dysregulation. So what do we do with this in the field of prevention? So we wanna exploit brain plasticity for preventative purposes. I already said that it's possible for targeted intervention to enhance neural maturation and have an enduring impact. Um, we want you know, to get uh, to get there early if we can, when the brain is most plastic and susceptible to lasting change before drug use and other problems become entrenched. Uh, we want more precision-based interventions um, and to look at more novel targets for intervention that are based on this information from neuroscience. Um, so we want to be able to detect and disrupt prior to the first use of drugs 
That's the goal, but it's never too late. And this just, this is an adult aggregate. This is in the aggregate again, brains um, who received a mindfulness meditation kind of intervention. And you can actually reduce the activation of the amygdala um, with intervention, with targeted intervention for people with anxiety um, in adults. So you can imagine what we can do in children. And this is what we're beginning to focus on. So I just wanted to show you an intervention model. What we try to do in our research is this with yoga. I love mindfulness. I'm not a mindful person. I need to learn. But mindfulness has the potential to you know, strengthen this top-down cognitive control of emotional responses. And so we've done this with a number of different interventions where we tear it apart. What are the component processes in the intervention itself and how do they map on to brain and stress physiological indicators of these outcomes so that we can improve them. And so this is sort of our integrative model to try and get at what is working in an intervention and what is not working and what are the mediating mechanisms that we're able to move the needle in. And these are just my final points. Um, I'm, I, I don't know if I'm over time, if I am, I won't go through, I am, um, so I won't go through them. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. Thank you so much. Uh, she is an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the Medical University of South Carolina. Her research focuses on understanding the effects of substance use on brain development and creating effective treatment options for substance using youth. She has a strong interest in community outreach and education. Uh, Dr. Squaglia, you're welcome to uh, start, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. All these presentations have been excellent. So I appreciate um, y'all organizing this and having me as part of it. Um, so today I'm going to be presenting about a neuroscience-based prevention program that we started here at the Medical University of South Carolina. Um, and this program is focused on adolescence. And so we know that substance use is typically initiated during adolescence with the typical age of initiation around age 15. So we see adolescents initiating substance use and this substance use escalating throughout late adolescence and into young adulthood. And as you can see from the figure here, alcohol, cannabis, and e-cigarettes or vaping products are the three most commonly used substances in the U.S. and in many countries around the world. And we know the earlier that kids start using, the more likely that they will develop problems later on. So if kid here in this figure, um, this is showing on the x-axis age. So from age 13 to 21, 21 is the legal drinking age in the United States. Um, on the y-axis, we see the prevalence of lifetime alcohol dependence. And we know that kids that start drinking before age 15 are four times more likely to, de to develop an alcohol use disorder than those who don't start drinking until their early 20s. And that with each year um, that a kid delays use, that decreases the odds of them developing an alcohol use disorder by about 14%. So this is a really critical period of time to intervene um, before kids start initiating and escalating use use. And several of the people on this call have been doing research um, in the area of substance use and how it affects the developing brain. So Diana gave a wonderful overview of how the brain is developing and how substance use during this critical neuromaturational period um, affects, um, affects the developing brain and cognition. And so I, I'm a neuroscientist. I've been doing um, this research for 13 years now, and there were three really excellent systematic reviews and meta-analyses that have come out in the past two years that have looked how, at how adolescent substance use affects both how the brain is developing, so the structure of the brain, but also how the brain is functioning. Um, and so these three reviews looked at alcohol and cannabis, which are the two most commonly used substances during adolescence. And we know that um, alcohol and cannabis use during adolescence affects working memory, attention, uh, learning abilities, and, and the way that the brain, um, white and gray matter uh, develop over adolescence. 
So as a neuroscientist, I was really interested in utilizing this, you know, over 20 years of information on how substance use affects the developing brain to inform prevention efforts. So universal prevention efforts are ones that are kind of given to all kids. So unlike um, there are some targeted personality interventions that are really awesome. So Patricia Conrad has done wonderful work in this area. Um, there, hers are targeted interventions. So today I'm going to be talking about more universal prevention and education efforts. And one of the most well-known um, in the US was the Just Say No program. So Hamid had referenced this. Um, so I, I was a D.A.R.E. kid um, and this program was, for those who don't know, um, police officers or cops would come into the classroom and they would say, drugs are bad and it's gonna break your brain and you're a bad person if you do drugs. Um, and I remember being a kid and being like, I don't even know what drugs are. <laughs> like, so not surprisingly, to those who are in this program, that kind of technique didn't work. Kids don't like to be told, never ever do something that you don't even know what it is. Um, adults don't like to be told this. So we know from years of data that these kind of programs don't really work. So at MUSC, we were interested in using science to create a program that we're call, we call the Just Say No, K-N-O-W uh, program. And it's really focused on the science, the neuroscience of addiction. So why neuroscience? Why focus our prevention effort um, using neuroscience? So one, we know that logistically it's easy, right? Kids are already in science classes. And so we can easily incorporate this into existing curriculum in the schools. So teachers like it. Um, we also know that there's some really cool research showing that young people show increased interest in neuroscience content. So when you present information to them that's backed by neuroscience, they're more likely to show interest in it and to believe it and to find it credible. Um, we also like that it, it is science backed and provides a credible argument. So it's unlike the D.A.R.E. program that was really based on cops' opinions and uh, other people's opinions. We're just saying, here are the facts, here's the science behind it. Um, and kids really tend to like that. And we also think that it helps decrease the stigma of substance use. So where the D.A.R.E. program was really focused on substance use being a moral failing, you're a bad person if you use substances. Um, this is really coming at it from more of a non-judgmental stance. So, um, you know, here's the science, here's how your brain is developing, and here's how substance use affects it. So the program is an hour long program. We go into the school. So here's a picture of Sylvia. She's our community outreach coordinator. Um, we bring a real brain into the schools. As you can see, some of the kids love it. Other kids are like, oh my gosh. <laughs> but overall, um, it's really popular. Uh, it's a tangible, like the kids can see an actual brain. They know that it's real. It's in, it's in between their ears. Uh, that's what's in between their ears. Um, so the, there are three components to this interactive program. First, we talk about how the brain is functioning and the neural reward system, explaining that to them. Um, the second piece, we talk about how substance use affects neurotransmitters in the brain. So how does the addictive process happen? And then the third piece is, um, you know, why are adolescents more vulnerable to the effects of substance use? So we knew that kids were really liking this program, or at least they were telling us they did. So we had a lot of anecdotal data, um, but no quantitative data. So a couple of years ago, we wanted to see, okay, like what's going on? Is this program even worth pursuing um, in a randomized controlled trial? So we did the one hour interactive presentations. We went into middle and high schools in the US. That means around ages to 11, from 11 to about 18. And this was um, a relatively small pilot program. It was funded through philanthropy efforts. Um, and we went and presented to about 1600 students. So um, in multiple different classrooms and multiple different schools, a fairly diverse uh, set of schools that we went to. And we had the same instructor for all the programs, which is Sylvia Rivers. And we collected information. We gave them pre and post test of knowledge. So we asked them about the brain neurotransmitters. We wanted to see, are they learning information that's new? And then at the end of the test, we got feedback questions to see, you know, what they thought of it, if they liked it, if they thought it was helpful. 
So the first thing that we wanted to know was, you know, is this helpful? Is this informative? Um, do kids like it? And 88% of the kids said the presentation was worth their time. And 94% said that it provided helpful information about the brain and substance use. So we were thrilled by that. To get 94% of people to agree on anything was just um, really thrilling <laughs> to us, very exciting. Um, so yeah, the kids found it helpful. They found it informative. Um, we also wanted to know, you know, were they paying attention? Did they learn things that they didn't know before? And we also found that, yes, that was the case. So here in gray are what they got on the pre-knowledge test scores in blue or post scores. So we broke it down by middle school around age 11 to 13, high school age 14 to 18. Um, and we saw that there was a 78% increase in their scores from pre to post test. With the post test, there were seven questions. It was really quick. Again, we tried to make it as efficient as possible. Um, you know, they're almost maxing out. So they were learning things that they didn't know before and they were paying attention. Um, they were learning things and, and paying attention, which was great to see that. Um, so then finally, oh, and I should say that, um, you know, there weren't significant differences between our middle and high schoolers. Um, they were learning um, pretty equivalent amounts. So it was developmentally appropriate for these ages. And then finally, we wanted to know what were their attitudes towards substance use and were we able to change their attitudes? Because we know that attitudinal change um, is related to behavioral change. And we found that 76% of the students said that based on the information that they learned, they would delay or cut back on alcohol or drug use. 15% said maybe. So overall, 91% said that either yes or maybe they would delay or cut back on their alcohol or drug use based on what they learned. So we were pretty thrilled with that. So the next steps for this, um, of course, are, you know, this was a pilot study, we were just trying to see, is it worth, is it worth pursuing? Um, we want to randomize with the control group, see if uh, this is more effective than what kids are getting now, which by the way, kids are still getting the D.A.R.E. program. <laughs> um, we want to see if, um, you know, we saw that there were these attitudinal changes, but does that actually relate to decreases in substance use? Because that's our ultimate goal, right? Is that based on this information, kids are actually not, are, are actually saying no to substance use or actually delaying substance use initiation. And then because we're neuroscientists, we're on top of the most recent literature, we want to continue to modify the presentation. And that's the benefit of having neuroscientists involved in these programming um, efforts is that we can start incorporating the wonderful research that a lot of the people on this call are doing um, to modify the program. So especially things like e-cigarettes, um, that just blew up a few years ago, right? So now we had to, we had to add um, slides on e-cigarettes and vaping products, and we can do that quite rapidly um, because we're pretty on top of the literature. So in sum, we saw that the presentation was helpful. The test scores improved so that kids were learning information that they didn't know before, and the information was developmentally appropriate for them. And that a lot of them changed their attitudes about how they would approach substances in the future. So we think that this is a promising, easy to implement um, program that could be tested and should be tested in a randomized control trial. So finally, I wanna say thank you to the wonderful, um, wonderful folks I work with at the Medical University of South Carolina and the Youth Collaborative. And um, yeah, thank you guys for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Squaglia. That was a uh, fascinating talk and really encouraging about this uh, new program. Um, and now uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our final speaker for today, Dr. Tara Rezapur, uh, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Cognitive Psychology at the Institute uh, for Cognitive Science Studies in Tehran in Iran. Her research includes creating, using, and studying the efficacy of neuroscience-based interventions in both uh, fields of addiction, treatment, and prevention. Dr. Razakur, you have it. Thank you so much, Jasmine, and uh, thank you for all the great um, speak. Um, I, I, it was my first experience to organize the 
panel and it was really interesting for me and I hope that all the attendees here uh, enjoy the session so far. Um, for the last uh, part of this session, I'm going to talk about the concept of cognitive resilience and also tell you about how we uh, come up with this concept after uh, around seven years working in the field of cognitive rehabilitation for substance user. Um, let me take a step back and tell you about the first attempt that we have made in this regard and uh, uh, that was NICORIDA. NICORIDA uh, stands for Neurocognitive Rehabilitation for Disease of Addiction and it was a 16 session paper-based program tries to improve different cognitive functions, for example, working memory attention. Uh, the function that were reported to be impaired in substance users, especially those with opioid use disorder. So uh, we developed NICORIDA and then we conducted a clinical trial study on a sample of 120 opioid users and we found that uh, those who received this program uh, indicated significant improvement in different cognitive function as well as treatment outcome and clinical outcome. But you know at the time we uh, finished the trial we found that uh, this version of NICORIDA needs to be more improved, to be more engaging and meaningful for uh, substance user. It uh, means that we should um, increase the far transfer effect of the uh, educational material that we provided for the user to be able uh, to, to make them more applicable in their uh, daily life activities. So the next step uh, would be the NIPER, the NIPER program that was neuroscience informed psychoeducation for recovery. And it was totally a uh, psychoeducational program um, designed into four sessions uh, that aim to improve users' knowledge and insight towards their brain function and also cognitive problems that may experience in their daily life activities. So uh, just before the uh, COVID pandemic, we finished a pilot study on the feasibility of this package and we see that people after receiving this NIPER program reported significantly higher uh, cognitive problems uh, compared to their baseline. It means that they gain more uh, clear understanding about their cognitive functioning and also cognitive problem. Uh, so if you want to read more about this study and also the program, you can uh, read uh, the preprint version of this study on the Med Archive. But the next step that we uh, took in this regard uh, was um, developing another package, another comprehensive package uh, that we named it as Neurocognitive Empowerment for Addiction Treatment or NEET. Uh, this program includes both psychoeducational material and also restorative exercise that target both cold uh, cognitive function as well as hot uh, functions. For example, we start from the basic uh, cognitive function, including attention and working memory, and proceed to more emotional and complex and high order cognitive function, including emotional memory or emotional attention, as well as self-monitoring. So uh, we defined two different uh, clinical trials, one in US and one in Iran, but due to this uh, condition, uh, both projects uh, were stopped and uh, we hope that we can um, restart this project after the condition become better. So uh, the, the most important point uh, that we try to transfer from the cognitive rehabilitation context to the prevention uh, context is the model that you can see in this slide, the easy core model. It, uh, it is a neuroscience uh, based framework that has different parts. You can see the saliency processing, attention, memory and interoception, as well as control. And we try to um, depict how people, how people with substance use disorder react to the drug related cues and how these cognitive functions work together uh, to control his or her behavior in response to the drug related cues. And so this is the main main point that we try to modify in the context of uh, addiction prevention. It means that we are going to, uh, as Lindsay said, um, um, att an attractive or engaging uh, program for uh, improving cognitive resilience for adolescents that um, includes different cognitive function. And, um, you know, we uh, try to define a con of cognitive resilience according to this model. Uh, 
It means that um, cognitive resilience could uh, include a different cognitive function or brain derivability and process for coping with the negative uh, consequences of stressful condition or adversity and try to maintain their brain abilities to uh, pass from the crisis and also solve um, problems or uh, efficiently make decisions in this regard. And uh, we try to, uh, you know, prepare the stage for this program in the chapter that we uh, we have just um, finished with Jasmine and also Dr. Echter and also uh, the other colleague. Then you can uh, read about it in the I think psych archive. And as you see in this slide, we have uh, also put uh, psychoeducational material in this uh, package that. Uh, use different cartoons, uh, attractive cartoons to tell about uh, people, especially uh, adolescents, that how people try and um, first uh, take the uh, drug for the first time and also become more dependent on them for the uh, uh, long term. So this, uh, this is the uh, end of my presentation. I try to talk so fast to save the time for uh, discussion at the end of the session. And so if anyone can uh, have any question, uh, we have time to talk about it. Thank you so much for your attention. Ask that, I realize it's a very broad question. What uh, do you believe the most important theoretical challenge for neuroscience in addiction prevention is? And uh, he asked from all the speakers. Oh, one one challenge is that there is there can't be a lot of crosstalk between fields, which have been rather siloed for right many decades, um, because of sort of different perspectives and approaches and you know ways of thinking and different jargon. Um, there's also been um, not a lot of embrace, I have to say, in the basic field of prevention science until recently, for the biomedical sciences in general. Um, there hasn't been a lot of recognition of it. And there's, you know, even with some a little pushback with others, just sort of a lack of understanding or appreciation. Like if models are working, if we have evidence-based interventions out there already, um, why do we need to look into the brain <laughs> to see how they're working? Um, you know, and, you know, we need to just really, like I said before, sorry to be redundant, but you know, models are, are, you know, they're good, they're, they're solid, uh, but they're not, you know, you know, meeting all the needs. We're, we're missing people. Um, they're not entirely effective. The small to modest effect sizes uh, issue has plagued us. And so we just want to get more precise. I also think, um, if I may, another challenge for the field is to understand the what I feel is sort of a critical responsibility, obligation of people who are doing work in this area once we have amassed enough knowledge that we can be confident in the findings that we do something with it and we don't just publish for each other, but that we help the public understand what ACEs does. What is ACEs? How does it work? How does it affect child development very fundamentally? Help policymakers to understand how they can possibly insert language and legislation that will protect children from the exposure in the first place so that we're not constantly grappling with the consequences. So those are a couple of challenges. I know they're not entirely theoretical and conceptual, but I think some of it has to do with the ability to you know, improve our crosstalk across the board. I agree, and I think that there is such a focus in academia on um, publishing and and doing all of those things for promotion and not doing outreach and dissemination to the community and so really restructuring the way um, that you know what we're reinforcing in academia and really putting outreach and education at the forefront and making that an important piece of of um, what we do. I think that that could be really helpful. And then changing funding structures too to really support some of these prevention efforts. Um, it's harder to get um, prevention type efforts. Um, funded and it takes a long time because you have to do the prevention and then follow the kids up for a really long period of time to see what happens. Um, and so you're really seeing like an absence of the behavior <laughs> is a good thing. So I think just kind of changing like what we're focusing on um, as far as like 
academic structures and also funding structures. And I just want to, to echo what uh, Diana and, and Lindsay has, has, have mentioned in terms of both kind of the academic uh, incentive mechanisms, in terms of how these types of things that we are doing. Uh, I was thinking about what, what Lindsay ha has done in terms of kind of outreaching 1500 kids and, and running this and even running that on something like a philanthropic fund but not somebody from, from a specific fund from, from NIH. So I was, I was thinking that probably one of the main issues is how academia is incentivizing these types of kind of activities. And meanwhile, the reality is uh, what we have in drug addiction as a brain disease, we know that there are complexities and we have at least two major dimensions uh, regarding, let's say, uh, destruction and also dependence and how these two different mechanisms are, are interacting with each other to develop what we call a full-blown drug addiction and how to communicate that complex, sort of complex uh, cognitive processes to, to the public audience and how to engage them in this process in a way that they develop a, a level of metacognitive awareness that they can see themselves in that specific framework and that would be translated to changing in their behavior. And I, I have been reviewing different, different recent works that people are doing in terms of developing neuroscience-based uh, preventive programs. I'm not sure we are still there in terms of uh, having good connection to public audience in terms of how uh, addiction does really change the brain in a way that people can, can easily understand. I think that we have kind of better models in areas like diabetes, so people have a better understanding about how diabetes is working. We probably need to work more on that. And also, we, I think that we need to bring art to what we are doing. Uh, what we have tried, we have tried to bring in cartoons and animations, and we realize those types of, inter kind of materials are gonna be really helpful. And if you just check the TED Ed, um, TED Edu, uh, the, the educational part of, of TED series, and they provide animations and cartoons. And there are few limited cartoons and animations regarding the substance use disorder. They receive something like 1 million views. But then you see the details that they are providing. If you feel that the quality is not still there, so you, you feel that there are still many things that we can, we can add. So I think that we need, to, we need to talk more and we need to discuss together. And Diana was sending me a message in terms of we need to continue the discussion that we have right now in this panel and think together to see how we can collaborate and how we can bring people from, from different parts of the world together. And the good thing about this meeting that we are in, we have people from all around the world in this meeting, and we want to kind of put together this video and put that in uh, ISAM channel, trying to make something like a coalition of, of people who are interested to bring in neuroscience to, to addiction prevention. I hope that that would be a starting point for further collaboration in international level. And maybe we can also think about, uh, for example, a consensus paper similar to what uh, we have done for the cognitive training, for example. And, you know, uh, I, uh, we are thinking about the, uh, forming a network to continue this or webinar. And so we keep in touch after this panel. It's, it's important what um, uh, one, one uh, aspect that Diana brought up about subtypes and how uh, assessment could be integrated into prevention and intervention. Uh, detailed assessment, identifying uh, more of the underlying mechanisms that may um, indicate different subtypes or biotypes of addiction that will respond to different interventions. Mm -hmm. I think that combining the two will be um, one way. Yeah, well, and Jasmine, your your presentation did that. It brought that your computational models brought the this you know integration into the area of addiction biology. You it just know, needs to be integrated now with the actual interventions and prevention. That that's the hope. <laughs> uh -huh, right. Yes. yes. Uh, the basic science. You got to do the basic science first, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Tara. And that was great. That was such fun. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank, nice Thank you. Great being Thank with you so everyone. Much. Thank <laughs> you soon. Thanks, audience. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.